Um, so without further ado, um, our first speaker in the session is Professor Kevin Fenton. Um, Kevin has worked at Public Health England since uh, 2012, uh, most recently as the Public Health Regional Director for London. As his Twitter bio states, he is passionate about health inequalities, uh, innovation and impact. Kevin was named as the second most influential black person in Britain by Powerlist in November for his work on the pandemic response and his leadership on tackling inequalities. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Kevin has spoken out about the unequal impact on minority populations, including overseeing the national PHE review on the topic. Today, Kevin will talk to us about COVID-19 health inequalities and recovery. Thank you very much, Kevin, take it away. Thank you very much, Nikki, and good afternoon and hello, everyone. I'm just going to confirm that you can see my slides and then we'll get started. Yes, we can see those, thank you. Wonderful. So hello, everyone. It really is a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to take some time to reflect on the lessons that we have learned over the past year, 18 months, as we have all been navigating the pandemic, either personally or professionally. And as the pandemic has unfolded, the degrees of inequalities that have become manifest, whether here in our own country or globally, uh, in terms of the direct and indirect impact of the pandemic. Today, I'm going to do a little bit of reflection on the year that's been. Uh, it's hard to imagine that it was only a year ago that the first of two reports from Public Health England looking at COVID and its disproportionate impacts uh, was published. Uh, the second was published uh, two weeks after the first. Uh, the first focused on the epidemiological data and the second went into the more qualitative contextual uh, data and engagement of thousands of individuals across the country to understand why we were seeing these disparities, what could be done and what actions both from government nationally and locally and communities would be necessary to prevent this action and this impact from occurring in subsequent waves. So in the talk that I'll be giving today, I wanted to reflect, first of all, uh, on uh, our learning over the past year, to reflect a bit on what we are doing specifically in London regarding a new approach to tackling inequalities and the new foundation that this may well lay for us uh, in the year ahead. So to reflect a bit on the UK experience of the pandemic. We are now post the second wave of the pandemic and unfortunately more than 4.4 million uh, individuals across our nation have been infected and tested positive uh, with the infection and we've lost more than 127,000 individuals from this disease. And the two waves of the pandemic uh, thus far are highlighted here. The initial impact in the spring summer of the first of last year and again in the autumn winter of uh, this, this past few months. So it has been a time of great learning about the pandemic, learning about the infectious disease, learning about its impact while building the response to the pandemic, whether it is a national test and trace system, engaging with local authorities on the community response or within the NHS, strengthening and learning about the clinical management of infections and how to reduce mortality and morbidity. Now, in the year, we've learned a lot about the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on a range of constituencies across our country. And in fact, the first reports, which were published, as I said, just over a year ago, looked at disparities in risks and outcomes. And this report from PHE looked at and was the first to systematically describe using the epidemiological data, the fact that we were at the first waves already beginning to see significant differences in cases by by age and sex, uh, with age being one of the strongest determinants of the likelihood of severe disease and mortality. In wave one, we began to see significant geographic disparities and heterogeneity and concentration of the epidemic with London, especially in other urban centers, uh, being especially hard hit in the first wave. 
And again, at that time in June of last year, beginning to look at the inequalities related to uh, deprivation with those living in less deprived parts of the city being less likely to have severe disease and death. And of course, putting all of these together, understanding that place matters in the lives of many minorities, we saw these significant differences uh, in cases and risk of death by ethnicity as well. Now, the reports at that time really looked at the wider determinants of, of these uh, uh, patterns of what we're observing, because it was important to look beyond the epidemiological data and to use that qualitative information to guide both our responses and to guide our understanding of how the COVID response should become more culturally competent moving forward. Uh, the reports had a number of conclusions, and for the interest of time, I wanted to just pull out some of the core themes arising from the qualitative work that we did. And perhaps the first most dominant theme coming from this, as we engage stakeholders from policymakers to those working locally on implementation to people from the affected communities, it was clear that we needed to frame the inequalities in COVID not as a new thing, but as something that had long pre-existed the pandemic, but which was made worse and made more visible and apparent to all as we've moved through the first and obviously and sec subsequently second waves of the pandemic. This, the reports really highlighted the multi-sectoral and multi-factoral nature of the drivers of the inequalities that we are observing, and especially looking at Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities, a range of factors, including behavioral factors, factors related to healthcare access, factors related to trust of government and trust of healthcare services, straight through to social and economic inequalities, and the role of structural racism and discrimination, occupational risk and stigma were all identified in the qualitative work and were all seen as key to informing a more comprehensive response to addressing uh, the pandemic as we were progressing through the first wave and obviously subsequent waves of the pandemic. And the stakeholders who were, we interviewed at that time expressed deep concern and anxiety that if the lessons of the first wave of the pandemic were not learned, and if there wasn't a concerted effort both to implement actions and to learn from uh, uh, the lessons from the first wave, then we were doomed to repeat these mistakes as we move through the pandemic. So this really called for an urgent commitment to better collaboration, better research, uh, better working with communities to address these risks. Now, as we move through the subsequent waves of the pandemic, we were really, it was really important for us to continue tracking what that, the disparities were and the inequalities which would exist. And as you can see here, data from London suggests that even although our data on infections and our ability to diagnose infections significantly improved as our testing capacity improved. So in wave one, those who were diagnosed were largely those with severe disease who presented into hospital. But by the time we got to the second wave, we had much more testing capacity and we were able to again show that with each successive wave of the pandemic, you do see a replication of the disproportionality, whether by those living in uh, more poor, uh, more deprived parts of cities, whether we see it across racial and ethnic groups. And in this chart, we were able to demonstrate the disproportionate impact on those from South Asian uh, backgrounds uh, living in London as well. So over time, these ethnic disparities have changed and they continue to evolve. In wave one of the pandemic, we saw uh, the disproportionate impact across many racial and ethnic groups with the risk of death, according to ethnic groups, especially for men, as highlighted in the chart on the left hand side of this, really varied uh, uh, by uh, more than 1.5 to over 2.5 to three times greater the likelihood of death than whites for men. And we saw similar disparities in risk of severe disease and death for women, although the impact and the severity differed by gender. 
in wave two, although we didn't see as stark inequalities that we had seen in wave one, we were able to demonstrate that uh, groups such as the Bangladeshi community, Indian community and Pakistani community continue to have that disproportionate burden of severe disease and death. And this has again been borne out as we've seen the impact of uh, new variants of the disease, uh, new variants of the virus. And as we're grappling now with the new Delta virus, this variant first described in India, we have seen this disproportionate burden again on South Asian communities. But the last year has also taught us that there are other factors which may well explain these risks, whether the risk of exposure or your risk of presenting with severe disease and death. And one of the things that we have certainly seen come to the forefront of the national discourse on inequalities and COVID is ways in which we protect those who are likely to be most vulnerable. And those are our key workers, especially those who have caring responsibilities for individuals who may be infected or at risk of acquiring COVID or key workers who are at risk because of their likelihood of being in contact with members of the public and a highly likelihood of becoming in contact with someone who is infected. And this slide just really shows the proportion of men working in the highest death rate occupations who are of an ethnic minority background. And here you can see perhaps what we observe most starkly in wave one, that high proportions of black, Asian and minority ethnic workers are in uh, occupations such as taxi, cab drivers and chauffeurs, uh, chefs working in the hospitality industry, working in care homes and of those who are care workers, as well as nursing auxiliary and assistants, and, and of course, uh, within the NHS as nurses. So not only did we see this disproportionate impact by occupation, but again, because of the higher proportions of these populations who are Black, Asian and minority ethnic, this may have and continues to explain some of the disproportionate risk that we have seen. Now, a key part of the work over the past year, both by researchers as well as those of us working in national agencies has been to understand intersectionality, to look at how ethnicity intersects with uh, deprivation, how it intersects with sex, how it intersects with other key characteristics in order to have a better understanding of both where to target interventions, but how to be more comprehensive in our prevention approach. And on the slide on the left hand side of this chart, this really shows that as you have increasing cases uh, in a more deprived areas, you see a higher proportion of those cases occurring in Black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. And that concentration of uh, cases among minority communities, especially in more deprived parts of the city, has been of, of the country, has been an enduring feature of the pandemic and the pandemic response. And over time, we've seen this play out, not just in the likelihood of being diagnosed, we've seen this play out in terms of response and uptake of testing, of contact tracing, and more recently, the vaccination program. Now, our work last year, nearly a year ago, in the PHE initial reports on inequalities and COVID really highlighted seven key areas for priority action across the system, whether working nationally, regionally or locally, if we were going to act concertedly to reduce the risk of these inequalities occurring with subsequent waves. And if we were truly to learn the lessons of the pandemic to build a more equitable future moving forward for health and well-being. And the seven recommendations are here, and we've been doing quite a lot of work in London, and I know in many regions across the country, looking at our progress over the last year with these seven recommendations and holding to account all of us as policymakers, program deliverers, partners in the community, to the degree to which we've made progress with each of these. So in summary, uh, the recommendations at that time focused on the need for better quality ethnicity data collection and recording in NHS and social care system, including better ethnicity recording at death certification. There was a call to research funders and policymakers to ensure that we did more research to understand not just the biomedical drivers of the changes that we were observing, but the social, cultural, economic, religious and commercial determinants of these inequalities 
and to ensure that the ways in which we do research are framed within in strengthening community participation in all aspects of the work. There was a number of recommendations which related to cultural competency, uh, ensuring that our interventions were developed with and by communities in ways that are meaningful and that matter to them, and that all parts of policy development, program development and research should integrate these culturally competent approaches. So whether that's for risk assessment, whether it's for educational campaigns, or whether it's for campaigns which are dealing with and aiming to improve uh, health, well-being and disease prevention programs, again learning from the lessons from the first wave of the COVID pandemic. And finally, as we think about recovery, it is absolutely important that we do this through the lens of inequalities, committing ourselves not only to building back better, but building back fairer and understanding the ways in which we tackle and face inequalities at the forefront of the design of our recovery strategies and not as an afterthought. So these are the seven recommendations arising from our work a year ago. And again, these have really framed work that we've done in London and around the country. Now, many of the lessons over the last year suggest that no, a number of the key findings and learnings from the initial PHE report have continued to inform the work that we've done in every aspect of the COVID response. So as I mentioned, as NHS Test and Trace began its work and began scaling up its testing and contact tracing program, we worked very closely to ensure that we were developing those programs with health equity and reducing inequalities in mind, ensuring that there is language competency, visible images of a diversity of communities, working closely with localities to develop approaches which are relevant to communities. And nowhere is this more important than our work with vaccine hesitancy, which started last autumn and over the past eight months has been scaling up as we've had the availability of the vaccines and had to deal with the real crisis of vaccine hesitancy and how that was in danger of destabilizing the vaccination response. So we began this journey in the autumn of last year, really doing research to understand vaccine hesitancy and vaccine confidence. And even at that time, it was clear that vaccine hesitancy was significantly higher among Black, Asian and minority ethnic communities compared with white British adults uh, in the United Kingdom. And certainly we've seen over time that although hesitancy has decreased and uptake in these groups are increasing, this has been an enduring challenge. We also saw differences in vaccination uh, rates, especially among those who do not speak English. And we saw similar disparities by uh, ethnic uh, group and deprivation as well. And a good example of this is work that we've been doing in, in London, where even among the white ethnic group, um, white Europeans, especially those from Eastern European backgrounds, had higher levels of hesitancy, lower levels of confidence, and were less likely to take up the, the vaccine. So the intersections, again, of your cultural background, uh, your uh, racial and ethnic group, uh, your economic status, and language competency are all factors that we've had to deal with with, this, with these inequalities. And again, data just showing the differences in uh, hesitancy and having a material impact on uptake according to whether you lived live in, in a, a most deprived or least deprived parts uh, of the country. So again, these inequalities are persistent and they are enduring and they have characterized each phase of the pandemic response. And as we now prepare for work on the Delta variant and are approaching the next phase of the roadmap, where we're seeing resurgence of the infections and where we're beginning to see outbreaks really mirror areas that we have seen in wave one and in wave two and many of those social, structural, and cultural factors uh, being key determinants of resurgence of infection. So in the final two slides, what I'd like to do is just to reflect a little bit on how we move from the data into policy and approaches that matter. How do we truly learn the lessons of the past year? And as we now know better, that we commit to doing better. 
Well, in London, we've been taking a look at everything we do on inequalities. And as part of the work that's now in train to think about recovery for the city, we have articulated ways in which there should be a grand challenge, both to restore confidence in the city, minimize the impact of the pandemic, and ensuring that we're working with London's communities to build back the city's economy and well-being. And we're looking at this not just in terms of an economic recovery, but a completely integrated approach that ensures that the key lesson that health is more than access to high quality healthcare, but really begins to take into consideration or efforts in recovery on a Green New Deal, ensuring that there's a robust health and care safety net, thinking about place and creating healthy streets for all, really thinking about our young people and how we support them, especially given the, the lessons that we're learning about the younger people being particularly and disproportionately impacted uh, in many ways uh, by the pandemic. Looking at effective high quality jobs across the city, a focus on mental health and well-being, digital health and access, as well as building community cohesion and resilience. This is part of an integrated approach that not only recovers the city, but has equity and building back fairer at its core. And some of the core principles underpinning our approach to recovery are highlighted here. A focus on structural inequalities, working in new partnerships with London's communities, building upon this extensive engagement that we've had to take place throughout the pandemic, but especially in our work on tackling vaccine hesitancy. Really looking at digital inequalities and using digital technologies and tools and data to better target interventions and work with Londoners to engage them in this pathway to recovery. And of course, linking agendas of well being and sustainability, as well as economic development, in a very new and exciting way. And again, the outcomes, as highlighted here, are more than just improving the economy, but really looking at inequalities, really looking at how we improve well-being and the life chances for young people. So as we move from the strategy to actions for tackling inequalities in the city, what are some of the key lessons that we're learning and key approaches that we'll be taking? Well, the first is ensuring that we build a legacy of the pandemic, which is focused on strengthening system capacity. So wherever you are in the system in the city, whether you're working in local authorities, working in the NHS, in ICSs, or at the regional level, or working in the GLA or other partners, that we now begin to both articulate our ambitions for tackling inequalities, but that we ensure that we have the capacity of staff, of workers, of strategy, of actions, that enable us to deliver on our promises to Londoners. And this has required us working together in new ways, new governance across the city, new human resources who are brought on staff, colleagues, partners who are brought on board to help us to uh, focus on this agenda and to work in a far more integrated way. We have developed both a new approach to addressing health and all policies, working with the Greater London Authority to ensure that all of the regional assets that are uh, touching the lives of Londoners are working to also improve well-being as well. And we are embarking now upon the refresh of the London Health Inequality Strategy uh, with an implementation action plan for the next three years. These strategic and policy responses sit aside alongside the policy responses in local authorities, in the NHS in London, and again with other statutory partners. So we're all focused on addressing inequalities and placing it in its wider frame. We're doing a lot of work on sharing data, realizing that better data and moving on some of the key recommendations, both better quality of data, but working with communities to understand why access to high quality data is important to improve their health outcomes is a key part of the conversations that we're now having with Londoners. And this is going to be critical as we move to the recovery phase, because we want to ensure that we're not building in inequalities or worsening those inequalities as we move to recovery. There's been a huge shift to focusing on the well-being of our workforce, ensuring that all partner organizations in the city are committed to equity, equality, diversity and inclusion, because we must work with 
and treat staff, our own staff, in ways that helped them to be productive and engage members of the workforce, but also to demonstrate that actually our commitment to addressing inequalities begins at home. So again, all of our uh, London partners working in this equity strategy have strong commitments to how we improve equality, diversity and inclusion, and we're thinking about opportunities for the, our organizations to, to work more definitively in this space. Our work with communities remains key, again, building upon our experiences of tackling vaccine hesitancy and the hundreds, if not thousands of engagement sessions that have been taking place across the city to mobilize around the vaccine, but then to pivot to what does this conversation, this engagement and this mobilization looks like as we think about the health challenges ahead. And then finally, thinking about ways in which we keep that drumbeat of communication and engagement, whether on vaccines, whether it's on inequalities for mental or physical health, or that drumbeat of engaging and mobilizing Londoners about building back fairer, these are parts of the narratives that are going to be critically important to ensure we're taking Londoners along with us, but more importantly, listening to Londoners and adapting uh, and evolving our approaches. So finally, we're in an environment where there are lots of changes taking place. The public health system is being transformed. The NHS is going through its own transformation and we're emerging from the pandemic and a focus on recovery. I think the last year has taught us all many things. The importance of data, research, information to truly understand and characterize the nature, magnitude and impact of these inequalities. The importance of le learning and listening and engaging and mobilizing communities, not just as subjects in research, but as partners in the implementation of public health programs, as partners in the design of programs from the vaccination program or, or recovery efforts. If we're truly going to change our behaviors, because now we know better, we must be doing better. And finally, the importance of joining up this work on equity, because it won't be solved in a day. But what it will require is for us working as partners and across system, systems with a shared understanding of our ambition and goals for addressing inequalities, with accountability structures built in to keep us all to account, and with the voices of communities there alongside us in both the design, delivery, and evaluation of our work. So with that, Nikki, thank you so much. And uh, I'll uh, end my presentation here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. That was fantastic. And that is echoed throughout the chat and the Q&A of people saying thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, there's lots of questions come in. Um, we're going to start with some questions on vaccine hesitancy. Um, and one for me, so you said that actually the um, hesitancy has been improved on uh, among kind of black communities. Can you talk to us a bit about the kind of what you've been doing in the area that has driven that increase in uptake? Absolutely. So when we first started polling in uh, December, November, December last year, Londoners, and I'll use the example in London because it has been so stark. We had in excess of 40 to 60% of many of our BME communities saying that they were not confident in the vaccine. And if offered, they were unlikely to take that vaccine. And we saw particularly high rates in Black Africans, Black Caribbeans, uh, Indian, Pakistani, and Bangladeshi communities in the city. As time has passed, we have established a fantastic program on vaccine hesitancy and equity uh, in the city. It brings together a range of stakeholders from the NHS, public health, local authorities, the community, to really focus on the data, what we're learning, and to develop a series which has four key strategies. Number one, uh, a series of community engagement events where we have leaders, community leaders, speaking to Londoners about the vaccine. Two, looking at data. So we had to really push to get the granular data that we needed in order to design where to target our efforts and to evaluate the response, uh, the impact of our efforts. Three, there was a strong evaluation component as well. So we were learning as we were doing, trying new things, evaluating it. And if it worked, then we were able to do it more or at scale or to stop doing it to move 
onto something else. So a very agile strategy was employed. And then fourth, as I mentioned, working closely with communities to really understand uh, why we were seeing the hesitancy, how it changes, and what more we need to do with communities in terms of uh, tackling some of the root issues. So uh, I'm pleased to say today we've more than halved the hesitancy and nearly tripled the confidence in uh, many of our communities. And the most tangible outcome has been the very high uptake rates that we now have, especially in Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi communities, uh, significant increases now seen in white Europeans and Chinese. And um, only on Friday, I heard that the uptake rates, especially in our Black Caribbean communities, has nearly doubled. It takes longer for all vaccines uh, to be taken up in London. This is not unique to COVID. And because of our urban health challenges, it means that we need to work longer, harder to achieve the same levels of uptake in other regions. But my goodness, we've been able to, to make that good progress and we're, we're, we're pushing to the finish line. Yeah, that's, that's really, really fantastic news that it's had that much of a difference. And I think there's a huge value in those targeted efforts. So um, another question that's come in is, given that we can improve that hesitancy, um, have you got any kind of work in the future to try and extend those community efforts to try and um, increase uptake and trust in other areas of healthcare? Absolutely, and I, I don't know if that was, I don't know the person who asked that, that question, but thank you so much for that question, because that's absolutely it. Because as we've been doing these engagement events, and I have to say, I, and I, I'm not saying this lightly, I've spoken to thousands, if not tens of thousands of Londoners, and many of us as leaders have spoken to hundreds of thousands of Londoners over the past six months. Um, you quickly move from trust and why trust is has been low, into how do we rebuild trust and a desire that we learn the lessons from COVID and we continue these conversations, this engagement with other issues that matter to communities because it's when we make that transition that people say, oh, so it's not just about the vaccine because their greatest fear is that you get the vaccine, get the uptake and we'll never see or hear from you again. So we're starting a program of work now where we're beginning to have these conversations as part of the London recovery effort, where we begin to tackle issues from housing to mental health, managing chronic diseases, right through to our aspirations together with the community of what a healthier, economically productive London looks like. And that I think is where the excitement of the recovery program building upon these lessons will be. And kind of in those community efforts, how, what proportion of your work is around kind of addressing past issues and kind of past racism in healthcare? And what proportion is kind of addressing the here and now and trying to be, yeah, focus on that? You know, it varies. When we started this journey, I'd say there was so much pent up anger, um, uh, concern, fear, um, from many of our communities and because few of them have ever had this chance to speak to the regional head of the NHS or the, the medical director of the NHS or the public health director in the city or even their local DPH. In the early days, it was, you know, we had some very warm <laughs> community engagement sessions um, where people had to, to be honest and we had to get to that place of authenticity. So I think in the earlier events, we had to deal with some of those tricky issues, but really critical issues and to deal with them honestly. And I think that provided that sort that level of authenticity in the conversation that we needed to have in order to get to the different place. But even, you know, I did a, an event on Friday on, on, on mental health and people were really important you know, talking about access to care, but again, the issues of systematic and structural racism and how that needs to be a part of rebuilding fairer because if you don't take the impacts of that into uh, account for the experiences of many uh, black Asian minority ethnic people, then you're systematically um, excluding a key part of stress, ill health and negative impacts in that person's lives. So our ability to name these issues, speak about them authentically and to commit to, to, to using whatever resources we have to address them is a key part of what we're learning. Nice. I think that segues quite nicely onto the next comment around um, the unequal impact of mental health that has been exacerbated during the pandemic. And how can policymakers address this often overlooked but very serious problem? Uh, so thank you for that. And the key thing is to recognize and call it out. 
So I'm not waiting and we're not waiting in London to talk about mental health uh, when we come out of this pandemic, because what we have seen over the past 18 months are increasing demands on mental health services on the entire pathway from the sort of preventative support uh, digital programs that we have to promote mental uh, health and well-being straight through to people dealing with severe um, and enduring mental illness, as well as people who are newly diagnosed. Across the entire spectrum, we've seen increasing demand, increasing need. And so I think the first thing is to name it, that this is a, uh, a, a syndemic with the COVID pandemic, and it needs to be addressed. Second, that the resources that we need to address this can't be the ones that we simply had before the pandemic and are simply trying to rearrange the deck chairs because the, the nature of the challenges and how profoundly they're affecting people and communities requires us to think differently. Third, because of the work that we've done with mental health with our communities, we have many mental health programs across the city which are engaging communities. And what we're learning is that now is the opportunity as we're rebuilding to really develop that community participatory approach to mental health services. So we're doing more co-design, co-leadership with the communities, especially the BME community, and designing now the, the sort of systems that we need for the future. And then finally, we have invested quite a bit in uh, mental health services for young people, which I think will be a key pillar of our work moving forward as we think about the impacts on young people, but also begin to focus on life course programs for mental health. So a huge program across the city, digital plus clinical care, plus community engagement and mobilization to, to address this. Great question. That's all very good to hear. Thank you. Um, Another one question we've got for you is um, the difference between the COVID mortality in Asian and Black Londoners suggests that social and occupational regions aren't the only drivers to the, of this. Have you identified any medical reasons for this and can these be addressed? Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, when you hear me speak about these inequalities, you'll never hear me say that there is a reason. There's one reason for the differences that we see, because there are many factors which are occurring uh, uh, concurrently and which are going to have a disproportionate impact on an individual. So we learned from wave one about the importance of factors such as obesity in influencing severity of disease and mortality. We've learned about the importance of many poorly managed long term conditions, including heart disease, diabetes, uh, uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, the role of mental health and how that can negatively impact your, your outcomes. But where these comorbid conditions are disproportionately distributed in populations, that can clearly have an impact on what you see in terms of who's presenting to hospital and who's having severe disease. And then always remember the structural factors, again, household composition and how communities cluster differently in place. So different communities may live in greater concentrations and their types of housing, their social and familial networks can place them at greater risk, depending, for example, if you live in multi-generational households, if you have lots of children who are going to, to school, if you're doing a jobs or work in uh, 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 key worker occupations, where you may be at risk of uh, becoming infected in the community and bringing the infection home. And finally, the link to, um, for many communities, their sort of home or heritage countries. And again, we've seen this in terms of those familial ties are not just to communities in your place, but they are often familial ties to countries which are hard hit by the pandemic. And which is why as we're doing this work nationally, keeping our eye and contributing to the global effort is going to be key given the uh, connectivity between our epidemic here and overseas. So just a few factors to, to add to the list. Yeah, I think what you highlighted beautifully there was how complex an issue this is. And I think you said earlier, what we need is, is more data and sharing of data. And hopefully, and I, I'm a bioinformatician, I love data. So I, I like that uh, as, as the way forwards here. Um, so thank you very much for your time. I think we're going to move on to our next speaker now. Um, but that was really, really fascinating. And thank you very much for your insights. Thank you so much and all the best for the afternoon.